Well, we heard a lot of talks in the morning which spoke about you know, the number of exoplanets being detected recently. So hundreds of exoplanets have been detected with over 2,500 planet candidates with Kepler. And Kepler is designed to give you the frequency of a particular planet uh, around a star. So what it does is that it doesn't characterize you. It tells you what the statistics are. Um, so does it work? So here's a plot which tells, tells you about the planet occurrence as a function of planet radius and orbital period. And it accounts for the observational biases. So what we now know is that you do have a lot of large planets the size of Jupiter, but you also have uh, even more larger, uh, a larger size of planets which are of the size of Neptune. And you have even more planets which are of the size of Earth, indicated by this color code. So red here, uh, red here actually means uh, you know, higher planet frequency. And green is towards the lower side. And with increasing sensitivities, one, you know, we, we, we foresee that there'll be a lot more planets towards this area where you have higher orbital periods and lower planetary masses. The interesting point here is that even with Kepler candidates, a lot of these planets are thought to lie in the habitable zone of the parent star. So which ones do we look for first? Which ones do we characterize for potential habitability and see if they're indeed inhabited? And that's where my talk really comes. So we know that spectroscopy gives you detailed information in regard to this uh, surface in the atmosphere of a planet. But the downside is that it's time consuming and it's expensive. So what I want to do here is use filter photometry where it's the amount of flux that you, uh, you, know, that you collect from the source and you split it into different broad, ba broad bands. And color ba basically means the comparison of one such band against the other. Photometry is a good tool to give you initial first order approximation. Uh, we know from the Earth that different surfaces have got characteristic reflectivities or albedos. What I want to see is if I can you know, remotely characterize these different surfaces and if I can build a link to biology. Colors have often been used, color color diagrams have often been used in galaxy astrophysics, for instance, to differentiate the different kinds of galaxies, be it elliptical or spiral galaxies. Also in stellar astrophysics to differentiate the different types of stars. One can actually do this for planets as well. So here's a plot of uh, you know, the green minus red filter against blue minus green, which Wesley Shaw from JPL did sometime back in 2003. And one can basically classify the rocky surfaces, probably because they you know, reflect dusty surfaces more in the near infrared bands. They tend to group together in the red red plot of this color color diagram. Uh, Gas giants, which have clear atmospheres, tend to uh, group together in the blue-blue part of the color-color uh, uh, diagram. And then you have these gas giants with a cloudy atmosphere, clouds and hazes, which prevent the, me prevent the, colors, prevent the colors, methane colors from taking over. And they uh, group together in this green-green plot of this diagram. And then you have Venus and Earth, which you know, have their own color space. What I want to do now is focus on an Earth's Earth analog for the different environments known on Earth that support extreme forms of life. Why do I consider extremophiles? Well, they define, they give you a wide definition of, for life, be it physical or chemical extremes, and they inhabit extreme niches. So you can think of the Earth as a zoo bound by a fence of physical and chemical extremes. And you can be anything inside of this uh, region. You could you could be fish or, or elephants or mammals, uh, you know, any sort of mammals. But as you traverse towards the boundaries, all these complex organisms fall out, and you have simple microorganisms. Outside of this fence, of, of course, I mean, a chemist, biochemistry breaks down and, you know, biomolecules denature. But at these limits, so you have these, so you could consider a limit, you could consider a case where you have high pH and temperature, like, like the case of the octopus spring at Yellowstone National Park. And we believe that certain exoplanets or rocky exoplanets outside of the solar system might potentially have these environmental conditions. And so therefore, one could use this as a strategy to prioritize targets you know, when compared to the Earth. So these are different kinds of physical or chemical extremes that I have considered. And I don't expect you to necessarily look at it. But 
let's take an example here. So I take salinity and desiccation. Now, most of the organisms that we know of on Earth live in subsurface conditions, either as a measure to protect themselves or a means to gain access to the required nutrients. So when you look at these surfaces remotely, you don't really look at salt, you don't really look at the microorganisms, but what you actually detect is the reflectivities or albedos of salt lakes or deserts in this case. So here's an example where you have cryptoendolithic lichens which are inhabiting sandstones. So what you actually see is the reflection spectra of a sand-covered earth. And here you have halophiles which are living in salt mines. And again, you see the reflectivities of a salt-covered, uh, I mean, this is a sand-covered earth, and this one is a salt-covered earth. So basically, and this is an example of you know, the flux being binned in different colors. So I have taken a case here from 0 0.94 to 0 0.9 microns. Basically, that's 4,000 to 9,000 microns. So I consider different surfaces on Earth which are, you know, uh, support extreme forms of life. I've also included uh, extremophiles where the reflection spectra is available in literature. So I have the reflection spectra of red-coated algae, wa al algae water where you have red algae coating rocks about 10 centimeter below the surface of acid mine drainage as a test case. I have this. I have the. I have the reflection spectra of li lichens, which are desiccation-resistant organisms. And I have the reflection spectra of bacterial mat, which is uh, made up of two photosynthetic bacteria, this, uh, the cyanobacterium synococcus and the photosynthetic bacterium chloroflexus, found at Yellowstone National Park. I've also included the reflection spectra of trees for vegetation red edge, which is often looked at by different groups for remote signatures of life. And plotting, and when plotting, and then, when I, the basic assumptions that I make is that the atmosphere is see-through, so there's no clouds and hazes, although there's a way to get around that. Um, I assume that the atmosphere does not substantially change with differing atmospheres. And for starters, I assume that the whole planet is covered by a particular surface for general detectability. So because if I cannot detect it when it's 100% covered by a particular surface, if I cannot characterize it remotely, then I cannot do it for any other combination. Also. Uh, you know, small changes in physical or chemical extremes can make a particular surface dominate. And therefore, this assumption holds true. So on plotting a similar color color diagram, but this time I'm not using customized filters like TROP did, but uh, what I did instead was use standard filters from 0.4 to 0.9 microns. We see that these different uh, surfaces group together in different areas of the plot. So you have red algae, which are uh, you know, in acid mine drainage, uh, grouped together with uh, this data point from acid mine drainage. You have rocks which support endoliths grouped together in this part of the spectrum. What's interesting is that you don't have lichens, bacterial mat, and red algae you know, grouped together with trees. One possible reason is that lichens are, are composite organisms made of fungi and um, either cyanobacterium or green algae. So the red edge for lichens are, red, are sloping as, a, as, as compared to you know, normal vegetation. Bacterial mat, on the other hand, they are covered by about 10 centimeter of water. And therefore, you have strong water absorption features longward of 0.72 microns. And therefore, the reflectivity of bacterial mat in this case differs from that of trees, for instance. The other point to note is that the data point for all of these photosynthetic, uh, all of these organisms having photosynthetic pigments is only valid around a sun-like star, an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. Because if you mo go towards a hotter star, then the black body spectrum peaks in the blue part of the spectrum. And therefore, trees will start reflecting in the blue to avoid overheating. And therefore, they might look blue in color. If you go towards a cooler star, uh, the black body spectrum of the star peaks in the infrared bands, and therefore, trees there's very little in the visible, and therefore trees will absorb throughout or any pigment, chlorophyll pig, if it has chlorophyll or like pigment, will absorb in the entire visible band, and therefore they might appear black in color. One can then uh, basically relate these different surfaces to the kind of organisms or the kind of uh, uh, extremophiles that's, that they are supporting for an aerobic and anaerobic atmosphere, which can help in spectroscopy, because then you know which bands to look at. Also, we know that 
the Earth has been anaerobic for parts of its history of life. Even on present day Earth, you have niches which support only anaerobic environments, and therefore you can build a link with aerobic and organisms and anaerobic er uh, organisms with the environment that it, it's inhabiting. But the whole point of this talk and the work was to find exoplanet candidates for prioritization. I want to know which Earth-like planets to look for first, which ones to characterize, because remember that spectroscopy, so future missions like, uh, like for instance, ECHO or, or any, any other characterizing mission will have only a handful of planets to look at first. So which ones should we look at? Kepler has detected hundreds and thousands of planets. Tess, the, uh, uh, a NASA-based mission, will also do that. But which one should we look for first? So I started considering mixed surfaces, but following my initial assumption of a particular surface dominating, I kept one surface as the dominating surface and kept increasing the surface content for water, because water, as you know, is required for habitability. So I, I took the whole parameter space from 0 to 100 for water. And what we see is that even when we increase the water and when we consider these mixed surfaces, although you have degenerate surfaces here, they all fall in this tight band which I call region one, defined as extreme Earths. When I, increase, when I consider non-extreme forms of life, these, uh, this region expands to region two, which I call then this habitable region. So what do we have now? So if I have two data points which are located here and here, although this point is interesting, we have no reference to compare with that to on Earth. You know? So therefore, this data point will get a higher priority for follow-up spectroscopy. But if we have two data points over here and here, then higher priority will be given to any data point which is towards the lower left, on, le lower left corner of the plot, because that would indicate higher free liquid water on the surface. Because remember, liquid water falls towards the bottom of the panel. And yeah, so basically, colors are useful in priority, prioritizing targets. They help you uh, build a link between environmental conditions and life. They can also be used, although I've used uh, organisms which are thriving in a particular physical or chemical extreme, one can use this for polyextremophiles, which can live in multiple environmental extremes, or any new organisms found in new niches. The important thing to, remember, uh, to note here is that this does not tell you whether there is life or not. What it tells you is that a particular candidate or a planet is it useful for following up. And therefore, spectroscopy with this method is useful for determining the overall habitability or potential habitability of the planet and also see if the planet is indeed inhabited. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks. The question is if I have thought of including clouds and hazes in my model. Yes, that's something I've been currently working on. So I spoke about, I said that it's difficult if there are clouds and hazes in the model. So basically, um, if that problem only arises if there's 100% cloud coverage, you know, then you cannot really see anything. But even if you don't, even if you have, say, 90% clouds, there's a research group in, in Spain, uh, Enric Pali's group, which has recently showed that uh, if you get a high enough signal-to-noise ratio every 1 20th of the planet's rotation, if you have, say, high time resolution, and you have high enough signal-to-noise ratio every 1 20th of the planet's rotation, one can basically integrate all these signals and construct the surfaces together using principal competent analysis. So it's possible. Yeah. So basically, if you use clouds, your reflectivities would increase. But you know, if you have, you can you have these windows, and therefore, if you add them together, you can still come up to the solution. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. All right, okay.